Welcome to the College Knowledge Podcast, sponsored by the College Planning Network and Paradigm Financial Group. Whether you're searching for that right fit college, applying to college, or figuring out how you're going to afford it all, you're in the right place. You'll hear from deans, admissions counselors, student athletes, and scholars from esteemed universities and colleges around the country. We'll dig deep to uncover their insight and unique experiences. So whether you're a student gearing up for college or a parent with college-bound kids, sit back, relax, and listen. Like you, we have lots of questions. Our guests have the answers, and we're excited to share them with you. Let's get started. We want to help. Send your questions to info at collegeknowledge.net. These can be about college, finances, careers, and anything else you have questions on. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of College Knowledge. I'm your host today, Joe Kearns, and we are very happy to have with us an international speaker, best-selling author, and CEO of College Ready and CR Tutoring and Test Strategies, Shelly Howard. Shelly, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I think the the first question that I always like to ask, especially, you know, someone in your area that's similar to what we do is, how did you get into this industry? What was it like? How, where did you come from? And because I know everyone always has an interesting story when it comes to, hey, I'm, I'm doing college planning. You know, it's not exactly, uh, I'll say a linear path in most cases. So what's your journey like? So my journey, I'll give you the condensed version okay. because, you know, it, it, it was a process. Mm -hmm. College Ready actually was started because of my firstborn. Uh, he came home from eighth grade, super excited. He's like, mom, I can't wait to go to high school. And I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, I changed my major five times and I'm still <laughs> figuring it out. He says, mom, I want to be a brain surgeon. Okay. And then it just got quiet and <laughs> we don't have any medicine in our family. And I, I had a little mom moment where like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I was the first to go to college on both sides of my family. We're a family of entrepreneurs. Okay. So college ready really was because of his why. Mm -hmm. I did go to his high school counselor. And unfortunately, she asked him why would he waste his time and money becoming a doctor when they don't make money anymore? Okay. And so I realized that this was going to be up to me mm -hmm. and him. And so I went back to school, got my master's, became an independent college consultant certified through UC San Diego, mm -hmm. and then started touring 25 colleges a semester. Wow. The fast forward is when he graduated, he got into seven Ivy League schools, got to attend Harvard for four years, graduated without debt went on to UC San Diego Medical School and is now an orthopedic surgeon at UCLA. Fantastic. So how about that? Yeah. Because I don't, so, I, you know, you, you do okay. hear eighth graders that want to be something and it doesn't exactly happen. So that's always good. He really was passionate about it, which is, which is great to hear. Yeah. It was, you know, wild because I have four kids. And mm -hmm. so him being the first, I'm like, wow, this is going to be more interesting than I thought or easier than I thought. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not always the case <laughs> with four kids. Yeah. So my second her dream was university of alabama and i'm like what is wrong with california mm -hmm. and she got a full ride so i let her go and she had a great experience the full college experience mm -hmm. lots of football and then my stepson is at san francisco state and my stepdaughter said she's just going to do something mix it up okay. she's at aau in prague the czech republic getting an international business degree oh, wow. So even my own four, yeah. after 16 years of doing this, still blows my mind how different each child is. Sure. Absolutely. So what is, so how did College Ready come about? Was it you, you know, helping your kids and then you said other families need this? At what point throughout the kids going to college did you say, I should be helping other kids as well? Yeah, it actually happened at my son's high school graduation. Mm -hmm. I was sitting there, just obviously a proud parent. And a young man sitting next to me says, dude, I didn't even know that kid was smart. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, then my job is done. He's a normal, well-rounded young man. He didn't go crazy with his academia. Mm -hmm. And that's when it all started, because I realized I could help you know, middle and high school students be the best version of them, regardless of what mm -hmm. that looked like, because I think college is just a stepping stone to becoming a, a brilliant adult. Mm -hmm. 
And that was, he was my reason. And then at graduation, obviously people are like, wow, how did he do it? What do I do? And I was doing it part-time on top of my full-time career. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute, I really like this. Mm -hmm. And so I left my 28 year career and I went all in and 16 years later, we have students all over the world. Right. So it's been quite a journey that was never my plan, Mm -hmm. but it has been a wonderful way that I get to do what I get to do and help these kids. Yeah, that's fantastic. So throughout the journey, usually uh, there's an eye opening moment that you realize, oh, what I thought to be true is not when because it's almost always happens when people start really diving into the college world. What was it for you? What was the aha moment? Well, so College Ready is my seventh business. So I am an entrepreneur. So I didn't have any business ah Mm ahas. I was like, oh, that part's easy. I I think the biggest aha for me was uh, people who waited and just wait and see attitude that Mm -hmm. freaked me out a little bit Mm -hmm. um, where they're like, oh, let's just apply wherever and wait and see what happens. And then we'll figure out how we're going to pay for it. That was my big aha because I'm a planner and a strategist. Mm -hmm. And terrified with the debt they were taking on because they chose not to plan ahead. Mm-hmm. That was a big aha for me. Got it. Speaking of the debt, how much of it do you know? Because I have a certain opinion on why the debt is so high. Um, a lot of it is, I'll say, not planning early enough. But how much of it do you think is, I'll say, the result of students? not planning early enough versus parents not planning early enough? Um, well, it is a 50-50, right? Okay. The student has to do theirs and the parent has to do theirs. Um, I think it's more of an attitude of mm-hmm. the family. I, I, I can't I, I can't blame the parent because the stu- if the student doesn't get good grades, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what the parent does. Yeah. And if the parent doesn't plan, the student is going to be limited on the scholarships that they can receive. Yeah. So for me, I tell them, you know, they both need to do their part if they want to do a, a reduced or, you know, significantly less cost to an education. Mm-hmm. And so when, you know, when you talk about a significantly less cost, what is, I would say, uh, again, how most people... I think think about scholarships, you know, how how most people think about them, Uh, at least what I hear a lot is where do I find those private scholarships? Where do I, you know, where do I get them? Uh, How much is reducing cost that you see a source of money that's coming from the schools, whether it's need based financial aid, whether it's merit based aid or these private scholarships? Where do you see that difference? And is that more of a myth that parents tend to see and believe it's like, oh, no, we'll just find scholarships to pay for school? I can give you real numbers. Great. Yeah, that that would be the easiest way for parents to be like, Mm -hmm. what? So in 21-22, our students received over 17.6 million in scholarships from the school. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe 100,000 independent college scholarships. So I want parents to kind of really lean in on what did she yes yeah, 17.6 yeah. million mm-hmm. <laughs> versus a hundred thousand mm-hmm. so it's uh, it's twofold i do believe we help students find the most generous colleges and and put together a standout strategy so mm-hmm. yes we are setting them up for that success yeah. on our own it probably would not be that way because parents don't have that privy mm-hmm. Um, and then the other part is once students are done applying to college, the last thing they want to do is independent college scholarships. So I think, you know, I have, I'm always very, uh, transparent with families and I'm like, this is our reality. Your family could be different, but this is what the norm Mm -hmm. is. What I see. Do you see the same? Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, and again, you know, not just your numbers, but you know, our numbers and national numbers, right? When you look at uh, the gift aid that's bringing out, I think the college board, their latest report said it's of all grants and scholarships and any basically gift aid that's given out, it's over 50% comes from schools, institutional money, right? And it's only about 12% of all money, but that also includes like the employer 
scholarships, which those are honestly the, the bigger ones that I've seen. You know, our clients, the, the students that have received decent privatized scholarship is coming from where mom and dad work. You know, those are the ones that I've seen that have been a little bit bigger, but I was just curious again, you know, sometimes I know what I see, but I always, you know, that it's, that's part of the reason we do this podcast. I want to know if there's something that is different, you know, and then kind of follow up on it. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very eye opening to a lot of parents, you know, cause that is one of those questions that they kind of say, well, how do we maximize financial aid? And I'm like, well, it, it's kind of come from the school and that requires uh, not, not a couple months of planning, you know, a little bit more, um, than that. You mentioned, uh, one thing there about, um, building a list of schools and ve- more, you know, generous schools. And mm-hmm. I think one of the things that I've always really looked at, and again, being very surprised when I first got into the industry is how important your school list is, especially the types of schools that you have and competitive schools and essentially applying to schools that might be direct competitors versus schools that are not like they don't care about an offer from another school. How important is essentially building that list, but kind of knowing things that work behind the scenes. And like you said, the generosity of schools, how important and when do you think that that has to begin for families or students? I think that's a great question because most parents don't even realize this is happening. Mm -hmm. And I I think number one is I would love every parent to know this. I I mean, it would probably ruin it for my clients, but I do think it's important. Uh, We we focus on a return on investment. Mm -hmm. That's what we consider college an investment. And so when I think about those scholarships, the merit based scholarships or the generous schools, planning is everything and it has to be done strategically. So that leads into your question of how do we put the list together? Mm -hmm. The list is the, I I think after the student does their job and and we're now down to, we have the GPA, we have the test, we, we have the data now picking the right list is the number one most important thing. Mm -hmm. And for parents, I know when I was doing it, that's how College Ready got started because I was so frustrated what it said on Google. And when I looked it up on the college website, did not match. Mm. And I was like, and then I would add in US News and World Report. And I'm like, what in the world? (laughs) None of it matched. And I'm like, how am I supposed to navigate this? And my spreadsheet was massive. And I was like, this is overwhelming because I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell families a lot of time. If I equate it to your taxes, you could do your own taxes or you hire a CPA who knows tax code. And all of a sudden there's magic money that shows up. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very similar for a seasoned college consultant to really know where the money's coming from. Yeah. That will save the family a huge amount of money and a strategy. Like you said, financial negotiations can't be done if they have no anything else to negotiate with. It is a business. Yeah. Yeah. We, we uh, try to teach parents all the time. One of uh, the recurring themes that we always say is colleges are businesses. They're run like businesses and they're the most profitable nonprofits that exist. You know, it's, we, we, you know, we, we, uh, we dove in, we actually looked at the operating budget of some schools. And it is astonishing, you know, for uh, I believe the one that we looked at and we're blown away by was the operating budget of Penn State here in Pennsylvania. It's over six billion dollars a year is their operating budget, you know, and so it's crazy. But when you start to take a deep dive into those statistics, you can understand if their operating budget is so high and you kind of look at their, you know, endowment funds, you realize, well, they can't give as much money out because if they give too much out, they're not going to be able to operate. You know, yeah. and that's where different understanding, again, just how that business side of it is actually run can lead to understanding a lot of how schools can give money out, right? Whether it is based on merit or whether it's based on, you know, the need of the family and the financial posi- positioning of the family leading into it. Very different, you know, uh, every school, very, very different. Um right. So when you look at, you know, uh, I'll say again, a timeline, 
I know it's, it's all, it's usually one of the first questions I always get asked and I'm curious where your answer lies. Parent says, when is the right time to start planning? What, what, what is, I'm sure question. you know that I'm sure you've been asked before, but in your world, what, what would you say is the right time? Oh, come on, Joe. I've never been asked that. I'm sure. I'm sure. Not, right? That's not yeah. it. it? <laughs> um, I get asked every day. Yeah. Uh, so it, to me, my answer is it depends on the child's maturity. I have two students this year in seventh grade that are more mature than two seniors I have. Mind blowing, not normal. Mm -hmm. And so when their parents came to me and said, we're ready, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. I have four kids. I don't know. And after I, I interviewed them, because college ready doesn't take every student. If a student's not emotionally ready, mm -hmm. it's not a good, healthy place for them to be. So I, I talk to every teenager that's going to come into the program and I help them help assess where they're at. You know, if they've never been on a college tour, or just been on a college campus, let's back up. Mm -hmm. That's part of how do we know if they're ready because they don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah. And so ultimately my favorite time is when they promote from eighth grade and they haven't made any mistakes yet. Okay. That's, that's what I tell families because it's fun. They're not angry seniors going, why didn't somebody <laughs> tell me that I had to sure. do it? Yeah. So maybe that's a little selfish that I, I like to get them when they haven't made a mistake. Mm -hmm. But if you can have the perfect timeline, it would be if they're mature enough to start when they promote from eighth grade. Got it. Uh, yeah. I mean, my candid answer is now, like wherever you're at, sooner is always, you know, always better. And, you know, the younger you are, maturity obviously has a major factor on that because what you're passionate about you may not know what you're looking for in a campus. If you can't answer those types of questions, it's hard to start to understand like building a college list. And I understand there is potentially a too early for that, but I am heavy on the financial planning side and mm -hmm. parents feel like they have time. And I'm like, eh, it's look at the debt in this country. There's a lot of reasons that debt is up there. And part of the reason is procrastination, you know, so from a financial side, because of how much finances plays us, you know, pivotal role in colleges and can play a pivotal role in what a college may cost. You got to start earlier. And that's, I love that answer around, you know, entering into ninth grade, because again, if parents are unaware that's it. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's what colleges start to see is that GPA from right. That's part of that cumulative doesn't happen in eighth grade. So you can make mistakes, eighth grade, but ninth grade, you know, that's where things start. So I like that answer is like, yeah, you, you haven't made any mistakes yet, you know, so you can help <laughs> avoid those mistakes, um, which is, uh, you know, also where I kind of get into the why I like that same time frame from financial aspect is mm -hmm. because of when colleges start seeing your finances. Right. I don't think a lot of families are aware that it's that January 1st of sophomore year. And again, same concept. You got to plan before that because you haven't made any mistakes. You can make mistakes in a, in a given tax year that certain schools now that might mean you pay more. So love the answer. Very, very true to my heart. I couldn't agree uh, more, but definitely sooner the better. But I like that fact that I think I might use that one. Hey, you ha they haven't made mistakes yet. This is the best time to, to plan so you can avoid them. I like it. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously the other piece that I wanted to get into today is the landscape has changed drastically in the admissions side of things. We're seeing major changes on the horizon with FAFSA and potentially what's going to happen with financial aid. I know there's still a lot of questions out there about it. How different have you seen things change from an admission side with your with your clients in the differences between pre pandemic? You know, I know things constantly change, but it feels like it's been an extremely rapid pace the past couple of years. Have you guys seen the same? I, I really see about every four years. The pandemic just happened to be in that cycle okay. for me. Um, every four years, there's a shift. And financial shift, academic shift, what the colleges are now focused on. When mm -hmm. they took away testing immediately, all the focus went, what? Yeah. Like, kids were like, yes, no test. <laughs> and schools are going, how do you want me to decide who comes? Like, yeah. you know, we have consultants in our program that are, were dean of students earlier in their, in their life. Mm -hmm. And 
they're they're like, I can't even imagine what it would be like to try to pick from this amazing group of students with very little mm-hmm. hard reality. Yeah. So those things I think are the big difference. The other thing is the international students. You know, they got locked out, then mm. they came back, then they pay double, then mm. they so that really messes with the cycle as well. You know, being out in California, we're we're privy to all the UC schools. And man, that impact was huge. And then the final impact is all the students who think that they're going to graduate and be influencers (laughs) and them going, well, why do I have to go to college when I can just sit at home on my computer and influence people and Mm -hmm. they throw money at me? And that's a new thing that, right, Mm -hmm. wasn't four years ago. So I always tell families, we can't we can't affect any of that. But Mm -hmm. what we can do is make sure that your student is the best version of them. So when they hit adulthood, they're ready for adulthood. A college is a stepping stone. I have to remind families, don't worry about the change. We'll take care of that as consultants. But ultimately, as parents, how do we help your child you know, nurture their gifts and talents and superpowers mm-hmm. so when they're an adult, they're still good. Right. But yeah, you know, every four years I've been doing this 16 years. So every four years I see this huge shift when my son got into Harvard to compare to now, I don't think he'd get in mm. like he had a four, six. Yeah. It was a high GPA back then. I mean, mm-hmm. or like, you can't do that. And it, he did, but You know, it it takes more. I just sent out an email last night. It takes more than a GPA and a test Mm -hmm. score. Yeah. That was eight years ago. Yeah. Now that is not going to work anymore. Yeah. So how will parents navigate when they didn't grow up in that world? Mm -hmm. That's what I have to help families understand. When you, when parents went through this process, it was a GPA and a test score. Mm -hmm. And whoa. That has changed significantly. So I would say that's what I see to be the biggest difference in the mindset of parents. Got it. So if it's, what are you seeing as far as right now, if it's not GPA and test scores, is it the essay? Is it the demonstrated interest? Is it, you know, uh, an interview? Is it your portfolio? Is it, what are you kind of seeing right now as far as the shift goes that, okay, you need more than just a good score. You need more than a, a good GPA. Is it course rigor? Is it AP? How, and again, this goes to early planning, right? You may have to know if the schools you're potentially want to get into, how many AP courses would you need? Like how much community service? Like what, what are you seeing as kind of, and I know every school is a little bit different in what they will tier, right? And how important it is to them. And they're using analytical stats and you know, I think that's one of the big business side of the school that I have learned over the years is rankings are very big to schools. I'm not a, my is you, every student should have their own ranking based on social academic fit and also a financial fit, not what someone else thinks of the school. That's my, that's my personal opinion. I don't necessarily like the rankings because it's school could be ranked the best in the country, but be the absolute worst for a student, you know, and you, you might be making a mistake through that. But um, to know the analytics and what schools do from the aspect of knowing that if we offer this student enrollment, what percentage chance or what admission, what percentage chance they have that they will actually enroll plays a factor into if that student is admitted or not. It was yes, crazy it to me. Yes, it was it adding, you know, that, that yields, you know, how many students do we need to accept to fill these seats? They know that number. It's crazy. They and they and and then I started hearing things like if you don't think schools are tracking, do you like their face? If you have Facebook, if you like, do you follow them? Do you like do you comp? like I was blown away to know that schools even I'm thinking, what would that have to do with anything? But to, <laughs> if schools are tracking it and, you know, how AI is is taking over a lot of things, I'm sure there's going to be other areas beyond GPA and test scores that is going to help with that. All right. If the student is offered admission, how likely are they to actually enroll? Right. Cause that's big for a lot of colleges, but I'm curious, are you seeing one item start to stand out more than others? As far as if it's the essay, if it's the, your, your course rigor, what are you typically seeing in that realm? A lot has to do with the university, mm-hmm. um, the college or the university. 
uh, because they're so diverse. But I can speak to to you made me smile that um, I had a student this year get into USC, but not their local state school. Wow. They got a no from the school down the street Mm -hmm. and they got a yes to USC. For anybody who doesn't understand the implications of that, it's mind blowing for this family. Yeah. And so um, it it absolutely, and the student was way overqualified for that local state school, Mm -hmm. but the parent thought, well, you know, just in case the pandemic comes again, we don't want to pay for USC. Yeah, understandable. So it was part of our strategy to protect the Mm -hmm. student and the family's budget. So I I do believe, um, well, I know that that does play into Mm -hmm. it. The other thing that we are helping students get clarity around is colleges want to know who they are and what matters to them. Yeah. They're looking for this big, audacious, just tell me what I have to do. And I look at them and I'm like, okay, I don't understand who you are and what matters to you. So maybe we should start there. Mm -hmm. And that is the one thing. I mean, this year we've had more success getting into Stanford, UCLA, um, the Ivies, like w- our success is mind blowing and our focus has shifted to the student and not just doing a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys for being a part of College Knowledge. Just a reminder, if you're sending your student to school, visit EliteCollegiatePlanning.com for free resources and to book a free consultation. And it's so counterintuitive when I meet with families and they're like, no, 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 no. We want to make them better mm-hmm. and we want to make them different. And yes, if that's who they are and what matters to them, right. but be genuine. Yeah. Colleges understand when the application and the student do not match or the 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 um, transcript and the student's essays don't match. They're like, what in the world is going on? There's a lot of head scratching mm-hmm. going on. And I think a lot of people are doing what their friends are doing. And that is the number one mistake that I see. So parents, please don't do that to your child. What works for one student is not the best plan for another student. Absolutely. We always say avoid the chatter, you know, and what somebody else did may have worked and been very specific, you know, for that situation, for that family, for that child. It doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. It could, but I'll say nine times out of 10, it doesn't. (laughs) You know. And it's frustrating for the student because they're like, well, why did it work for Jimmy mm-hmm. and not work for me? Yeah. Am I not as good as Jimmy? And I'm like that. Now we're getting into the whole social thing. Right. That makes me sad because it shouldn't be that way at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I try to always uh, help parents and students understand you got to manage expectations. You know, you're not you may not get into every school that you apply to, but it's not because you're not good enough right Mm -hmm. it's ultimately because you the school maybe just didn't see it as a fit you know um a couple of the counselors that i've spoken with in the past have uh also mentioned that they want students who are not the with the resume that they have all you know 12 different things that they're essentially we'll say good at or passionate about they want to say okay you this student is passionate about one thing and we want a student that's passionate about that so we can match them up with another student who's passionate about something else. And that's essentially how they create some diversity with the class that they accept, right? So they could be looking for something very specific and it just may happen that if you don't fit that mold, it just may not be a fit for them. You know, it has nothing to do if you're good enough. They just might say, we've had students like you that we have accepted and they've been here for a year or two and they've left and that's kind of the recurring theme so now we realize we shouldn't be accepting students that have a similar back it doesn't mean you're not good enough it just means it may not be the fit so uh and i know it's a stressful time for seniors when they get those you know wait list or rejection letters and uh it it can be very disheartening but the reality is too i think that's part of building the proper list and knowing well what are my chances, you know, and having schools that are good fits so that again, you, then you can start to compete with other schools and then you can ultimately come down to the financial fit and say, all right, I applied to these schools. Now I know what they cost, which ones are in our budget, which ones are not, which ones am I going to be graduating with a ton of debt? Which ones can we cover? And I'm graduating debt-free like your son, right? Um, 
because then you don't have the discussion, which unfortunately I have a lot where a student gets wants to go, you know, out of the 10 schools they got accepted, they want to go to the ones that is the most expensive. And, and that's when we talk about return on investment. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then you have three schools that are almost, you know, under $20,000 a year, like unbelievable offers. And they said, but I don't really want to go there. I'm like, well, then why did you apply? Right. It, do, it doesn't make sense to me why you would apply to a school that if they gave you if a, ph- a phenomenal, basically free for the student. Right. Yeah. And for what the parents are able to bring to college. It's a free ride for the student. But you'd rather go somewhere like why would you even apply there? Wouldn't make sense to me. And that's where I think building the proper list is you can avoid that discussion on the back end and Correct. make sure you do get a good return on investment that, you know, cause the debt, the debt crisis is real and it's, you know, one, it's close to $1.8 trillion. And that's mm-hmm. also with no interest accruing right, on <laughs> government <laughs> loans for three years. So, you know, it, it, it is real and it's crazy. So uh, I'm glad that, you know, there, there are organizations like college ready that is mainly doing things the right way to help families do it the right way to avoid being part of that statistic. It's great to hear. Yeah, it's, you know, it started from a place of I was a single mom going through it and I couldn't afford. So Mm -hmm. I had to be really strategic. You know, sometimes when you're put in that position, you have to figure it out. And, and that's, that's the interesting thing I tell parents when they do this on their own, it's like gambling. (sighs) It, you, you don't know what you don't know sure. until you do it. And then hopefully you didn't mess it up. Well, you only have a few chances depending on how many kids you have. Mm-hmm. And that's the scary thing. How, what is the risk? Well, the risk is like $300,000. Yeah. That's the risk. It's, it, it's out of pocket <laughs> without interest too. If it's not yeah. far, like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I help them get clarity on. The other thing is I think as a parent, I can honestly say that, I always think my child is better than they might be. Mm. And sometimes that's a hard reality for families. It's like, I have families call me and say, Hey, my kid has a 4.0, you know, Stanford's on our radar. And I'm like, here's the average statistic, you know, a four nine. Mm -hmm. And they're like, how do you even get a four nine? (laughs) And I'm like, Again, what they don't know is the scary part Mm -hmm. and then helping them understand that, yes, your student is amazing, but I also want you to see what other amazing students look like so you can have a really good view of what your reality is. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes is hard for the parents to hear, but I'm like, wouldn't you rather hear it from me and be able to fix it Mm -hmm. than just go apply and not get in. I mean, unfortunately, I get a lot of second student, second borns Mm -hmm. because parents do experiment with the firstborn and they're like, well, I spent all four of my children's tuition or savings on my first child. So I'm in trouble now. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. My my dad, I'm the oldest of four. And my dad always says I was the guinea pig. He made all the mistakes with me. So the other three could you know, do th- they could do things the right way with the younger three. So, <laughs> um, and I did everything yeah. wrong in the college process when I was a senior in high school, I think is part of the reason I'm passionate about it now, you know, school choice was wrong. Didn't do the search the right way. Very limited focus, not casting a wide enough net, you know, and, and realizing that it caused harm to me. It delayed my adulthood. It delayed getting married. It delayed having kids. It's, it's real, you know, and mm-hmm. I don't want other, uh, students have to face that, you know, it's cause it's real. And again, from the, the financial side, you mentioned that $300,000 number, right? I, the other piece we look at is college is a retirement problem as well. Parents, yes. if you want to put your kids through college, it, how do you retire and do both? It's the perfect storm in a lot of cases, you know, a lot of parents right. get done paying for college and retirement's right around the corner after that. How do you manage all of this? And, you know, a, a key part is, well, get the cost as low as possible. Know the systems, know the games. And like you said, there are things you don't know, right? Avoid the chatter, avoid Google. (laughs) You know, it's, it's, you know, um, it's crazy because I I would say without a doubt, probably, and you mentioned this earlier, where I think the majority of families come to us, like uh, after, you know, we meet with them, we typically ask like, well, guys, where were you getting your information before? 
And mm. I would love to say it's the guidance counselors because I, a lot of the guidance counselors in our area are fantastic. Mm -hmm. But usually where parents try to build their strategy is from a coworker who already put somebody through college. And you yes. mentioned that earlier. It's, it's really nuts. A lot of parents just don't know who to listen to, which is a major concern because you may hear differing things, different opinions, different strategies. And you say, well, which one's right for me? And until you know, talk to somebody that knows the game and can assess like so many things you've mentioned, the specific student, the specific passions that they are, how mature are they? When's the right time? Then you can start taking, you know, the right road, you know, and there's going to be a lot of forks in that road. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. and, and making sure that the student uh, is supported as they go through it. Absolutely. I know doing it four times, I actually paid somebody to tell my children what I was going to tell them mm -hmm. because I wanted to love them and I wanted them to come home when they graduated from college. Yeah. A lot of families are in head to head battle because of this situation. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people hire college ready because they want to just give high fives and hugs and they don't want to, are your applications done? Are your essays done? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? You know, that accountability and chores and homework and all of that. And so as a parent, I, I would just really um, want you to think about what you want those last few years at home to feel like, mm -hmm. because college is not going away right. and it's not going to get less stressful. It's not going to be less competitive. None of that is going to be less. So how will your family navigate that? And then, of course, having that financial question on, well, that's great. You can get into Stanford, but how are we going to pay for Stanford? Mm -hmm. That is a hard thing for a family to do on their own. When I do it with the family and the student, it's not a personal thing. It's here's a reality. What, what is our strategy? Right. And sometimes just having that neutral party there is such a blessing because that family can have that hard conversation without it turning into I'm a fail, failure parent because I can't afford to pay full price for Stanford. Mm -hmm. I bring that up because that's the hot topic right now. Stanford is like on every parent's mind um, in my program. Being in California, that's our Ivy. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is one that is a challenge to get into for California students because we are not a diversity mm -hmm. at that university. Got it. So it's interesting. They would rather take somebody outside of California to bring them in for the diversity of the East Coast, West Coast. Mm -hmm. And so parents are like, diversity, what are you talking about? And they're thinking skin color. And I'm right. like, no, they can only have one CPA or one accountant and right. you know, one marketing. And, and they're like, that is a whole new concept mm -hmm. for most. Yeah. Speaking of that, you know, I know that there some of the stress, it's real that senior year. And I know that students definitely feel it. And some of it, it does come from the parents. How much is it that you see, right? Different other side of the country, right? Um, one of the, th at a counselor presentation I saw, he, he said that what we need to focus on is fit, not fame. And it's mm -hmm. usually the parents are the ones that say, oh, you got to go to Stanford. Like, I need the name. I need the flag. I need the bumper sticker. I need to be the proud parent. Mm -hmm. I don't, again, I've already mentioned, I'm not a big, it's to me, there's a ranking for each individual student. And, and this counselor made a great point and said, all right, we're speaking to a room of juniors here. If I guaranteed that every one of you could go to Princeton next year, would you go? Like, you're, if you tell me right now you're in, I will guarantee your acceptance. And every hand went up and he said, you're all doing it wrong. All one, every one of you he said, you don't know if that's the right fit. You're focusing on the name and not if your child's going to actually succeed. Are they going to transfer? Are they, you know, is that the best true fit from that social and academic standpoint? Right. So. Is that a conversation that you have to have with parents when they say Stanford's on our radar? It's like, whoa, I know you, let's be real about the money and are you likely to get in because of how tough it is, right? But what about, I mean, do you think that people in your world still come in kind of focusing on more name and the, you know, the elite prestigious type name of school versus do you then help with, okay, well, why do you want to go to Stanford? And if it's, well, it's Stanford versus, well, they have this class size and they have this program. Like you can be very, it's a very different answer. How important yes. is that for parents to understand? I mean, there's four, over 4,000 schools in the country. 
No right. two are exactly alike, right? Yes. So how, how, how important is that in your world and you, what you see to find that school that it doesn't always have to be the name? Or is, do you believe opposite of what I do? And you can, it's okay if you do. Yeah, so I do, I, I agree. And I have a different thought process. Okay. Having an Ivy League student um, was like, wah, like that, that was a huge thing in our family. Like I said, I was the first to go to college mm -hmm. and we didn't even have it on our radar, but my son said, I, I need a reach school. Okay. And I'm like, well, all right, what does reach look like to you? And he's like, well, let's just go with the number one and see how that rolls. Mm -hmm. So for our family, it was never a focus on okay. an Ivy. It was let's throw out a reach school and see what happens. Yeah. And it just happened that they said yes. And it shocked that my son asked if America's Funniest Home Videos was hiding. <laughs> <laughs> so he was kind of like, mom, please call him. I think this is a joke. Like he really did not ever believe that was in his future. Okay. And so we didn't go that person. You know, it wasn't a label for us. It was a fit. Okay. And he he wanted to be with top tier students because he had never been challenged in high school. OK. And so for him, he's like, I don't want four more years of people cheating off my paper. Got it. I, I want people who are going to challenge me in my thoughts. Yeah. And I want to graduate with an alumni group that I will never have to worry about getting another job. All I have to do is make a phone call mm -hmm. like he had told me all of the benefits that he was seeking from an Ivy League school. And I'm like, well, it's not the name. It just happened to be that when he applied, Harvard was number one on the list. Mm -hmm. So for, for my family, I have to speak to how my son went about it. And in all reality, Harvard has been a phenomenal opportunity. Mm -hmm. The world opened up when he graduated. His friends are now CEOs at a very young age. And so I'm seeing the benefit of his 11 roommates and how they've jumped from graduate to life. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there is a bigger jump for a lot of students. But on the other side, I have a lot of people who I just want them to go to da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, why? My favorite all time is I had a student say, I want to go to UC Santa Barbara. And I'm like, wonderful school. Why would you want to go there? And she goes, oh my gosh, have you seen the view from the dorms? And I was like, all right, then we <laughs> need to do a little bit of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So sometimes it's the student and, and what they're hearing, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's the parent uh, and the label. And sometimes it's truly a student saying, hey, I need to be among the best of the best because that's where I feel my fit is. Yeah. And it feels right. I had a student last year, quality problem, got into Harvard and Stanford. Wow. How do you help a child with that decision? Yeah. Right? It was... Well, there was money involved. And mm -hmm. so it became very easy in my eyes. And they picked the, the one they were paying full price. Mm. And I'm like, well, OK, I yeah. did my job. I gave you options. Right. But it's interesting. I have students that are 3.0 to a 5.0 in our program. Mm -hmm. There's a school for everyone. Sure. Right. It. That's what I have to help people understand is if you just go after a name, we can show them that not every school has every major. So when they say, I want to go to X, Y, Z, and I want to be an engineer, and I show them that they don't have engineering, I'm like, what do we do now? Right. They're shocked. They yeah. have no idea that not every major is at every school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it is a bit of an educational process. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, and, and again, I think it's uh, the benefit that parents get when they are willing to understand we don't know what we don't know we need help right is tremendous right and when you do go to experts that like you mentioned the accountant right yeah you can file your own taxes you can go to somebody else that may be able to help you lower that price significantly you know um it, it can do wonders and it's again not something that people should I, my opinion is it it's too complex to really do it on your own. You know, it, it is way too much. And the, the financial repercussions of it can be devastating, not just for you, not just for your kids, but this snowball effect that now your kids are graduating 
and they're in debt and it's going to take them time to get out of debt. So they're not going to be able to save for their own kids college, which means they're going to be in debt and college is going to be more. So it's going to be this ever evolving, um, you know, snowball. that just continues to grow. And OK, let's let's nip it in the bud. Let's not be, again, like one of those statistics that is just adding to this massive debt this country seeing. Um, the last question I wanted to ask today, because I know, again, from where you're at could be different and I'm always want to hear different opinions. Um, the SAT. It's going mm-hmm. through changes. We've already seen what schools are doing from an option to, you know, very few required. I think, did I just hear Stanford is getting rid of it altogether? Did I hear that? No, there's a lot of chitter chatter out mm-hmm. there until I read it from okay. Stanford. Got it. I, 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 again, I stay in my own lane until show me mm-hmm. and then I'll believe. Got it. So that was just, that was a side question, by the way, because I think I thought I read <laughs> something, but um what do you see as the future of the SAT? Do you think students should continue to take it when they kind of make these changes with the electronic? I've heard it's supposed to be a little bit easier. Like, what do you what do you kind of think that the it, again, we've already mentioned it's not just GPA and S tour SATs or ACTs. But what do you think? What do you think the future holds with that kind of standardized test? I, I, I do the student by student. OK. Some students are really good test takers. Why would they not want to showcase their talent? Absolutely. Other students are just not. I mean, I have four kids. I know that there is test anxiety. Mm -hmm. One of them had it terribly and we, you know, got, got her through it. But what I tell parents is this preparing for the SAT or ACT or even APs is not a waste of time because you're learning how to beat the test, which is something you'll do all the way through college. What my son learned preparing for his SAT is what got him a 98 on his MCAT. Mm. He used the same strategy, different material. And it's not a waste of time and it showcases your talents. And so if I have a student who wants a top tier school, I don't know when they're a freshman, what a college is going to be doing Mm -hmm. in four years. So why would we want to gamble? Why don't we build that into our strategy until our strategy says, Ooh, that student should not share their test score. And then we pivot. But I think it's not fair to the student to assume things will stay status quo from this year to next. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's a fair thing to do to that child. Yeah. Yeah. It's ever changed. I mean, school, you mentioned how things like that four year shift, it's always changed. And then the government is always yeah. changing things too. You know, there's a, there's a lot that's constantly changing in the college world. Always need to stay up to date. And we joke with our parents saying, guys, you know, we'll help teach you. We'll educate you what you need to know when your kids are in college. And then you don't need to know anything about it ever again. Like, but when you're in it, you got to, you got to know it in and out. And that's what we, you know, we always strive to help. And it sounds exactly what you're doing too, as, Hey, there's something more important these years than it was five years ago. We have to focus on that moving forward. So, um, always great, great stuff, you know, really appreciate it. The, the time today, um, Shelly, anything else that you would add to that we didn't talk about that if there's a, a simple you know message that you always like make to make sure that parents receive there was a lot that we covered today but i wasn't sure if there's anything specific you will always like to make sure parents hear uh, the one thing i i always want families to hear is a plan and a strategy is the key to a reduced education mm-hmm. the cost of education and so i i have a best selling book and it's how to send your student to college without losing your mind or your money and it's all about the foundation of what you can be doing now it's a bit of a workbook if you will mm-hmm. a, a a very quick read for a busy parent and that foundation is what i would really encourage families to get clarity around because if you don't get it it's going to feel like there's a huge elephant in the room and you're scared for four years. Mm-hmm. If you build the foundation, it's like anything else. Now we you know, build the walls and then we decorate and it's quite easy. Mm-hmm. But without that foundation, I just the overwhelm is is the part why people call me late in the game. I have it. I have it. I don't have it. Mm-hmm. And so I would encourage every family um, to start that foundation as soon as possible. Appreciate it. That's a great message. And Shelly, mm-hmm. if our listeners want to find you, where can they, where can they reach out to you at? 
Absolutely. So our website is www.collegeReadyplan, that's P-L-A-N.com. And I am happy to offer any of your listeners a free copy of my book, which is freebook.collegeReadyplan.com. Again, it's the foundation and I want you to have that. So to all your listeners, it's my gift to you. Thank you so much. Well, Shelly, this was great. Really appreciate it. Guys, this has been another episode of College Knowledge. Make sure you tune in next week for even more critical need to know college knowledge. We'll see you next time. We can send your student to the school of their dreams and send you to your dream retirement. Visit us at EliteCollegiatePlanning.com to get started. Thanks for listening to the College Knowledge Podcast with your hosts, Dave Kozak and Joe Kearns. We hope you enjoyed this week's exploration of higher education, sponsored by the College Planning Network and Paradigm Financial Group. That's all for this episode. See you next time.